You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Hi, I'm Sherry Bloodworth, and I'm the Operations Support Director here in Georgia with the Department of Community Supervision. I'm excited to be here with fellow colleagues as we discuss or have a conversation about women in criminal justice. We know that women face specific challenges uh, within the criminal justice systems worldwide, and that these challenges can affect their experiences at every stage, from arrest to incarceration to reentry. So um, today we have an opportunity to hear from the panelists and to discuss the unique needs and circumstances of the justice-involved women and share a few best practices within the great state of Georgia. Before we get started, I'd like to take a few moments for the panelists to introduce themselves. So, Melanie? Yeah, I'm Melanie Scarborough, and I'm the Assistant Chief with the MaxOut Reentry Program and with the Georgia Department of Community Supervision. And I work as a liaison between the Georgia Department of Corrections, the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, and the Georgia Community Supervision. And... I currently work at Lee Arendelle, uh, assisting the women there as they re-entry back into the community. Um, I help them transition from incarceration to felony probation and parole, and I specialize in those that are maxing out without probation or parole to follow, making sure that they get everything in line so that they're able to have all the th- all their needs met before they walk out the door and have a better chance of being successful. And we also work with lifers, and even those that are not currently assigned to me, we kind of assist in making sure that they understand what they need to do when they're released and follow all their instructions with probation and parole so that there's not any hiccups. Hey, I'm Pamela Wiggins. I'm the Director of Women's Services for the Department of Corrections for Georgia. Uh, My job entails overseeing every female facility Uh, of corrections within the state of Georgia. Um, We oversee uh, approximately 4,000 women currently. And part of my job is also to ensure that we are addressing the unique unique needs of our women offenders. Um, I also have the pleasure of uh, providing resources to every warden and superintendent that oversee our women's facility and developing and researching uh, unique programs that address the needs of our female offenders. My name is Renee Sneed. I am one of two operations managers for the Reentry Services Division for the Georgia Department of Community Supervision. And in my role, I work with community coordinators and other reentry specialists as they are making sure that we have a continuum, continuum of care for people who are leaving prison and going out in, into the community. So I'm working to develop strategies and policies, overseeing staff, just to make sure that reentry is successful. And my name is April Ross. I'm the executive director for the Georgia Commission on Family Violence. We're a government agency that's administratively attached to the Department of Community Supervision. And we're a unique agency because we're one of the only states, Georgia's one of the only states that has a dedicated government agency that's looking into family violence. And so we have a lot of functions in the state. One of our main um, legislative mandates was to create Georgia's state plan to end family violence. We also look at the statistical um, numbers for family violence in Georgia, domestic violence, dating, stalking, violence, all of that stuff, sexual violence as well. And we analyze that information and look at best practices on how to improve Georgia's numbers. We are very much an evidence-based agency looking at how to translate what our numbers are telling us into how we respond in Georgia. Uh, we have a lot of training involved in our agency. Uh, we, work, don't, we don't work as closely with, uh, with, with direct victims who are um, impacted by family violence, but we work a lot with the agencies and the partners, uh, community agencies, advocacy agencies that do provide the direct services. Uh, and we do a lot of partnering, legislative lobbying, and so on and so forth. Uh, So we're great and happy to be a part of the Department of Community Supervision because it's a great partner for us right now. Thank you so much, April. Thank you all for being here today. 
So the Department of Community Supervision has a very unique mission uh, to protect and serve the citizens of Georgia through effective and efficient community supervision uh, for individuals, all felony, probation, and parole, while providing, for, uh, providing opportunities for success. Just a few statistics. We have, uh, we have about 38,500 females currently under supervision right now, uh, which is a slight increase from last year. 25% of our new entries over the past year were females. 95% of our females are on probation supervision versus parole. 35% of our female population are between the ages of 30 to 39 years old. 37% of females are being supervised for drug offenses, followed by 34% for property offenses, and 19% for violent offenses. And about 41% have at least one or more dependent. So Pam, can you share a few uh, incarceration statistics with this place? Sure. Um, and it's, it's funny that you say that because the Department of Corrections, we mirror a lot of those statistics. Um, we have about 4,000 offenders currently, uh, and we have one on death row. Uh, we have about 67% who are parents, who are moms. We have about 56% who have a high school diploma, GED, or higher education. Um, there's about 55% chance that they have some type of substance abuse history or current issue. Um, there's a 50% chance that she is the victim of trauma. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, I was looking at some national s statistics and it was staggering. Uh, from 1980, to 2021, the number of incarcerated women have has risen to 525 percent. I thought it was an error. That's incredible. It's not an error. 525 percent. So in 1980, we had approximately 26,000 uh, women who were incarcerated, and by 1980, we had a staggering 168,000 incarcerated women involved in the justice system nationally. Um, like, nationally. Wow. That was that was staggering. Huge increase. Yeah, yes. Increase. And and that's why it's so important that we highlight, and I'm so glad that we're on this panel today, because we need to definitely shine a light on what we need to do to provide uh, support and care for the offenders. Um, I'm very passionate about helping uh, women put their pieces back together. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pam. So I guess this is a good uh, segue into the discussion about challenges. What mm -hmm. challenges uh, do we see with justice involved women? And, and Pam, yeah. with you being from facilities, I'll yes. start with you. I think the biggest one that I've seen thus far is infrastructure. There's only one prison in the state of Georgia um, that was specifically built from an architecture standpoint for women. We have about four prisons statewide, and then we have one prison uh, that is coming online soon. But the prisons that we have were built for men, and then we convert them for women. But that means that you have to know the unique needs that women need. Women need privacy. Women need space. Women need uh, places to take care of their hygiene. It's, it's very unique, and I'm extremely proud of uh, the Department of Corrections because they have uh, given a lot of resources to address those unique needs that women are facing now. Um, and I can't help but daily go back to the staggering number of 525% increase. So I think that all of us play such a major role in making sure that we're developing those policies and those best practices to address those needs. Um, sometimes I, I get tunnel vision um, because I'm so passionate about making sure that whatever those needs are in 2024, that we are addressing those as uh, specific as possible. Uh, and that's why I say the agency, uh, GDC, has done remarkable at putting funds for these uh, unique needs that these ladies have and allowing 
uh, us to reach out to national uh, consultants to see what's being done in other states and other countries uh, as it applies to the management of our female offenders. Great. Thank yeah. you. And, and speaking of facilities, transitional centers are also run by the Department of Corrections. They are. But we have a very unique uh, partnership we do. with Corrections we and do. CS with the Max Out Reentry Program. And I love it. And, with, <laughs> and I love so, that program. We do too. Yeah. So with Melanie, with you being a Max Out Reentry Officer working in the transitional centers, what challenges do you see in that um, scope of reentry? Having worked at a male facility, a male transitional center, and a female transitional center um, has kind of given me a different perspective because um, the needs of the women are so different yep. than the needs of the men. Right. Um, and while we do have fathers in the transitional centers, um, and I'm not minimizing that, right. there are just so many women in the um, transitional centers that have children and that have families. A lot of those women have um, had their children removed by Department of Family and Children's Services, right. and they, um, you know, are trying to put their life back together because as they come to the transitional center, obviously that means they're transitioning back into society. So now the reality sets in Correct. that they um, want to work that case plan, that they want to put their family back together. Right. And, um, you know, I, I try to do everything I can to help them try to reach out to their caseworker that they have with the Department of Family and Children's Services by, um, you know, helping them reconnect. A lot of times being in the prison system before they, they haven't been able to make that connection back with their case manager and their children are in foster care or with their right. relatives. And I understand that families get frustrated with them, but sometimes those family members that have custody of those children have cut ties with them. So it's all about... Um, encouraging them to stay on the right path to be able to reconnect. And um, so I do a lot of work with that, make sure that they can, they have mental health needs that they need to assess. And once they come to the transitional center, they can get involved with our community partners that um, can get them on the right track as far as mental health stuff, which helps them as they go back into society, but also is usually part of that case plan and why the kids were removed towards substance abuse issues and making sure um, we have, um, you know, Alcohol Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous that's actually inside the center. And a lot of times those classes are run by um, actual residents there at the TC, which I think is a great thing. I kind of have a mentoring program with them. But, um, you know, it's just a big challenge for them to try to work that case plan while they're there and have those connections. But we have um, a program actually at Lee Arendelle, which is a work well program. So the girls yep. learn um, budgeting. They learn um, life skills, how to grocery shop, all those things that right. they're going to need to be able to do with their families. And I think that that's wonderful. They actually get to have a real graduation. Yep. Um, and some of them have never graduated from anything. Mm -hmm. And um, those women need that. They need that encouragement. They need that um to, to just be proud of themselves. Right. Um, so, um, like I said, we, we address educational needs. If they can work on their getting their diploma, and then a lot of them work on going back to taking some college classes. So, um, if they have a lot of them have lost their driver's license, yes. so we go to court yep. with them. I, I transport the girls to actual court. I reach out to wherever. You know, it might be 10 years that they've been locked up on mm -hmm. their driver's license. Some of them have never had a driver's license. Yeah. So right. help them study for their driving tanks. They come to go get all that stuff. So they just have a lot of, not that the men don't, but they, the women just have a lot of individual needs to try to put their family back together. And um, sometimes it's just that encouragement and getting to know them and for somebody to look at them and say, hey, you can do it. So I really love my job as a moral but officer. We, we really love having a more officer baked into the program of the TC. It just gives that program a lot more credibility that we are trying to have a seamless system Absolutely. from incarceration to reentry. Even though we all know reentry starts where? And as soon as they are in sync. And we keep that in mind, but, but to have a bookend of reentry with a more uh, officer embedded into the program, that's awesome. I love it, and I like the fact that um, you know, those that are um, 
a lot of those that I have, actually, I keep them on my caseload if they stay in the area. Really? So, yes, I do. Awesome. So as they transition out and they make um, parole or um, on probation, then so once they go out, then I remain their officer in the field. And so then I go out and make their field visits. So they already know me. I, they don't have yes. to, they don't feel like, I think sometimes when they have to re-explain their situation, they get re-traumatized and have to tell that story again, how they came to the place yeah. that they were. And I think sometimes that's humiliating for them or whatever. They don't have to tell me again. I'm already right. there. I already know what they're working on. I already know what they've accomplished or what else they need to do. And that's so awesome. I like that seamless part that I can, you know, supervise them once they get out. So to Absolutely. And Pam, we're thrilled about that relationship too. So yes. Yes. Um, thank you, Melanie. And speaking of substance abuse, we know that mental health and trauma are very big contributing factors to um, substance abuse and incarceration, mm -hmm. particularly with women. When you talk about the 525% increase, we yes. know that a lot of that is contributed to substance abuse, mental health, and trauma issues. Yes. So April, can you talk to us a little bit from your work that the Commission on Family Violence does, I know without, I know you guys don't provide direct services, but how your oversight can assist justice-involved women who have been impacted by domestic violence or trauma? Right, absolutely. Um, well, first thing, you know, we do know, we've already heard about the statistics, and, and it's no secret that, you know, we expect on average about one in three women uh, will have experienced some form of domestic violence or sexual violence in their lifetime. So a lot of times women who end up in this cycle of, you know, incarceration have trauma that's related to one of those things from child abuse um, or from, you know, past intimate relationships where they're in that cycle of violence. Um, we know it's a cycle. And so one of the things that we often uh, are concerned about is way women are arrested, uh, whether it's related to the domestic violence that they've experienced or not, um, you know, how do you get them out of that cycle of violence once they are back in the community? So, and I'll see, I'll share this information, you know, like I said, we work a lot with community partners and state agencies. One of the things that came to our attention through some of our research is that women um, related to family violence, women are actually starting to be arrested at higher rates in family violence incidents. Um, and it's not necessarily uh, the equivalent that women are uh, becoming the aggressor at greater rates. That's not true. Because um, it doesn't bear on the statistics we see with fatalities and with, with serious injuries. Really. Um, but it is the case. And what it means is that more women who are actually victims are instead becoming uh, labeled as offenders. Wow. Well, um, and when women feel that the justice system is not supporting them, sometimes we know for a fact that they will turn to their own means, which may mean they kill their abuser. Right. So a lot of times you see women who have gotten life sentences yes. or killing an abuser yes. uh, or an offender, I mean, uh, uh, their domestic violence abuser. Uh, and women tend to get much more harsh sentences uh, statistically. I'm just speaking statistically. Um, the harsher sentences for uh, killing an intimate partner. So what we, what we believe in, we work with a lot of partners on the Justice for Incarcerated Survivors, trying to get more mitigation to their sentences after incarceration. So that, you know, so working with district attorneys, working with courts to see if they might minimize the, or re reduce the sentence or adjust the sentence based on evidence that was not admitted that should have been admissible about the history of abuse. Um, and on top of that, I think it's really important from our standpoint in terms of best practices mm -hmm. to have a program that works with women who are incarcerated and are going back into the community on healthy relationships. Not because because what, is, like, what is often yes. saying, well, even if they don't yes. go back to that past abuser, mm -hmm. right. they tend to be in the cycle where they, they find someone else. else. Yeah. The same kind yes. of person. Absolutely. And we see that in corrections so much. And you make such a valid point because women tend to be relational. And so when they get into these relationships, I call it behind the wire relationship, we find so many instances where the victim becomes the abuser because of what she's gone through before getting incarcerated. And making that point, April, about um, healthy relationships, 
Um, that is one of the, the things that we are really, really focusing on before they go back out into society to give them those tools to cope with how to disagree. Yes. How to have conflict without having physical conflict. Yes. So that is that is awesome. Yeah, and I'll say, you know, one of the things that our agency is also a part of is certifying and monitoring the family violence intervention programs in Georgia. And one of those, we, we have women's uh, classes and we have men's classes. But yeah, it's really important and on top of the, uh, the relationships to yeah. teach how to, how to handle conflict and disagreement in your relationships. It's a normal part of it. But if you've been through a cycle of trauma and abuse, right. and that's what you know how to respond to disagreement, then you will find yourself, you know, in a place where you're, you're, you're subject to either um, being arrested for being an abuser right. or truly becoming a batterer. You're spot on. Um, yeah. You are spot on with us. Yes. Yep. It's, yes. That's great work. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, April. Um, to the group, in addition to what April has talked about with, um, with those, those issues and concerns with the loop system, what societal attitudes do you see that mm -hmm. differs between men and women who are involved in the legal system? Oh, you know what, April, <laughs> and I, 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 I can just say it. I, think, I read this book one time about um, the Native American community. I think it's in Oklahoma where they arrest more women for things like substance abuse, right? And in that book, it talked about the fact that society views us as nurturers and caring and all of these warm, fuzzy things. So when we commit a crime, the same crime that a man has committed, a lot of times in the justice system, we are going to be sentenced Harsher. You is so much more egregious. Yes. 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 Like, yes. how dare you? How You're dare the mother you? of the earth. Yes. <laughs> and how yes. dare you commit the same crime that a man has committed? Yes. Well, even as yeah. being a mother, like, I think a lot of people think, oh, well, if they have a substance abuse issue and they're a parent. Yeah. Or they're a mother. Well, then why can't you stop using drugs for your kids? Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. You know, you know if, it's a, if it's a man, they, they don't. The, the children are never brought into that. I don't, I don't hear people think, that, oh, well, you're a father. Why can't you quit for your kids? Nobody, I don't want to hear people say that. I hear them say, well, why? She's got three children. Why does it? She just get off drugs. <laughs> it's the same thing with intimate relationships. Yeah. Why wouldn't you leave in oh, yeah. a situation if you, for your children? Right. So your right. mother instincts to kick in and help you get and make, make you leave. Well, we know leaving is the most dangerous thing. And most of the time, sometimes when someone stays with an abuser, it's not because they want to endanger their children or keep in a relationship that's dangerous. Sometimes they feel that sometimes the enemy you know is better than the enemy you don't. And you know, when you're with that person, right. you kind of know what to expect. Right. When you leave, you're watching your shoulder. You're watching right. on your shoulder every minute, and you're worried about who coming after you. So yeah. leaving isn't quite, quite such an easy solution, it's not. but women are often penalized mm -hmm. for not leaving. And, mm -hmm. and what you said about you know that, you know that evil that's already there. Well, with trauma and abuse, it's a cycle sometimes. And I've talked to so many women and they'll say it correlates with he gets a paycheck, he goes out and he drinks, and then he realizes he spent all the money and now we have financial issues and then there's the abuse. Yes. And it goes in that cycle. So to April's point, they know what they're dealing with and sometimes they know how to navigate it just enough for their kids. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great point, a great point. Yeah, and I mean, you know, there's a lot of research out there that talks about some of the gender bias in the court system <laughs> and in the law enforcement um, system because unfortunately when you think about it, the majority of law enforcement is it's a, it's still a very male-dominated um, profession. Correct. Uh, and, and so when you talk about officers going out on, on domestic violence calls, uh, and having to try to, you know, navigate the scene and interview the witnesses and assess who's the, you know, who's the uh, pre predominant aggressor is what we call it now. We used to say primary. But a lot of times they come down to sometimes who hit first or, you know, who's got a scratch. Um, and, you know, it, it oftentimes, again, it leads to a woman being arrested who is truly the victim. If you were able to look at the big picture mm -hmm. of the site of the history of abuse in that couple. Um, and then and their self-esteem and the shame that yes. comes with that. Right. 
And then people look down upon them like, there again, you got your butt. So you're just viral. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, 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 just, it's just round and round. Yeah. But I, I would say this, Sherry, that we have an opportunity out of this world in the jobs and the roles that we have to change that narrative. Absolutely. I find myself being in spaces a lot of times educating uh, people within our agency that just because she's emotional or just because she does, she wants to know why, um, that does not indicate insubordination. Absolutely. It does not indicate aggression. Okay. So it, it is very impactful for us in these roles to know that we have a responsibility to change the narrative. Absolutely. We have a responsibility to say, okay, let's all pause. Um, in, in women's prisons now, I mandated that every staff member that works in a women's institution has to take what's called gender responsive and trauma-informed training. And that is so important because a lot of times people don't understand the significance of respectful language. When a, when a woman has been exposed to trauma, those things are triggered. If you have a, a gentleman or another woman working in an institution and using uh, disrespectful language, loud language, all of these things, and research shows it, are triggers. And the, the women who have been exposed to massive amounts of trauma that takes them back there. Absolutely. When, when you are not being uh, respectful or when you're not respecting boundaries and space. Um, those are all things that evidence has shown um, cause them more trauma. So it's really important in our roles, one, to educate people that she's not aggressive. She's emotional, but she's not aggressive. <laughs> right. uh, and we, we teach how to de-escalate the situation. Sometimes it's important. It yeah. is. Sometimes uh, you have to have a certain demeanor uh, to come into a stressful situation and be willing to explain why you're asking them to do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes with us, we only want to, one, be heard, feel like we have a voice, and then feel like we have that necessary support system. So I, I am excited about um, what our agencies are doing uh, to address this, to highlight the needs that, that we have, and to highlight the pathways in which they have come to my doorstep. Because the pathways are different for women than men coming into corrections. So that means that you have to know why they got there and what their needs are and what's wrong with asking them. We can't assume. We need to ask them, what is it that brought you here and what is it that will help you put your pieces back together? Hey, that goes back with our as Department of Community Supervision, yeah. felony probation parole, our yeah. person-centered supervision model, our framework that we have. That's oh, yeah. Exactly oh, yeah. Yeah. Like where that yeah. So what is that? Okay. So it, it is, instead of just having a cookie cutter um, thing, we meet people where they are and address their specific needs okay. and with a specific case plan that is tailored just to them. Okay. And, um, that, that framework also, or that model also includes uh, teaching dignity and respect mm -hmm. and treating them with dignity and respect in the way you speak to them right. and the way that you talk to them. Yeah. And um, you, you get a lot better response with that. I know you can. And um, yeah. you, you find out there are so much, they open up to you so much more oh, when you can mm -hmm. um, talk to them and when they feel like they're receiving respect right. and when they feel like they have some dignity. So, I think, yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> We all got whole lot. Like, <laughs> we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, all good. No, but that was that's a good point because sometimes I have to tell people we don't we don't cuddle we don't hold hands. She's not special, but she does have unique needs that are different from the males. So I I continuously navigate those waters when I have to explain she's not special, but she is different, mm -hmm. and her needs are different. So let's let's move away from the perception and let's go into the reality of the situation. I think it's such a yeah. key point that you look at what the background is, what drew what brought one into where they are, 
because I mean, even in the domestic violence in, um, you know, field, mm -hmm. we've found studies and it's so true that women don't, women use violence differently. Women commit violence for different reasons than men. And so it's important to understand that and really get into the history of the abuse and the cycle that she's been through. I mean, another key issue is the human traffic survivors. Oh, yes. you know, they yes. end up committing crimes and mm -hmm. incarcerated because of the trafficking and their and their trafficker, you know, kind of requiring them to. Yes. Well, I yes, I, I, I think problem. I've encountered yes. yes. several and dealt with several women that are now actually sex offenders and have to register mm -hmm. because they themselves were pulled into human trafficking and forced in their position yes. to recruit. Absolutely. So now they are labeled as a sex offender and have their own charges. And what it, it's just a sad situation yes. that really needs addressing in those women. And it needs education because there you go. Are not that that is it, right? They don't want to call it education, but they want to, yes, you know, label them, you know, in, 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 in isolation. You yeah. cannot view the incident in isolation. You need the context. And mm -hmm. if our society, you know, we talked yes. about society earlier, if society yes. isn't willing to kind of look at context when it comes to women abusers, women offenders, right. you know, then we're going to continue to miss the ball when it comes to how to get mm -hmm. women back re-entering in society. Yes. Yeah, because now you have the shame and stigma of oh. being a sex offender, right. and then you're labeled with someone that might have committed the crime of child molestation. And it's actual. To totally yes. different than than this sort of offense. And every time you mess up on reentry, every time you mess up on getting that yeah. one acclimated and ready or fully able to be independent and, and self sufficient, you right. open the door to that person entering in from my perspective, entering back into that cycle of a bad relationship that's gonna yeah. bring them whole circle back to where they started. Now I'm gonna tell you something. I I realize Georgia's on the cutting edge because we are in hub because of our airport. We are a hub for human trafficking too. And I have just started trying to do research. In Georgia, unbeknownst to me, the Grace Commission that is led by Governor Kemp's wife, Marty, mm -hmm. she has a Grace Commission that addresses that very thing. Yes. Yes. That Commissioner Oliver is on that committee. So I think that we have a great opportunity to really push how can we serve those who have been victimized by human trafficking. That is so big right now. And it's kind of like a huge elephant, and we got to figure out. Right. And how to eat that. It's one of those things that's yes. creeped into my world. Because yes. I, we, I didn't realize, unbeknownst to me, there was a great intersection between domestic violence and human trafficking because yes. they start yes. out believing they're in relationships with mm -hmm. these people and then yep. they end yes. up yes. converting them into being trafficked. Yes. 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 Well, ladies, I think we could probably talk all day long on this side. <laughs> oh, a very, very good conversation. I do want to transition now into um, policies, current policies, um, practices that we are currently involved in, um, from the facility side to the to the community supervision side. Mm -hmm. um, I do. I want to put a plug in for our opportunities in the community for treatment. Uh, DCS um, oversees about 35 day reporting centers in the state. And these day reporting centers, along with accountability courts, there's, there's generally an accountability court of some fashion, if not more than one in, in almost every judicial circuit in the state now. Mm -hmm. But the, with the accountability courts and day reporting centers, women can be sentenced to probation to complete these treatment programs instead of having to go behind the walls. Yes. And this, this this affords these women an opportunity to remain employed if they do have a job, right. and particularly to stay within that family unit. So they can either still be in their children's lives or uh, go ahead and start working on that family reunification plan if they have a CPS case inside the community without being taken away um, and incarcerated. So that's just uh, one of the things that we have going on with, with DCS. Um, Pam, if you will, talk about what you guys have going on in the facility. We don't have that kind of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the uh, really, really great things that I remember I said, I take my head off to the agency, and I have to put a plug in because they put their money where their mouth is. So we have what's called a postpartum unit at Lee Arendale. 
This is a unit totally dedicated to helping uh, transition from a, a woman transitioning from uh, having her baby and unfortunately having to have family to take care of her baby. That is very traumatic for a mom to have to give up her baby because of her circumstance. And we recognize that. And we're not going to further traumatize the situation by just kind of saying, here you go, now you get to go and be a part of corrections. Uh, we have a program and a unit that is right next to our infirmary that is totally and solely dedicated to the moms who have had their babies in custody. And uh, it's a six week program where they are in their unit alone. They're not with anyone other than the ladies that they have developed relationships with prior to having their babies. And it's centered around community. It's centered around compassion. Um, there is a mental health component because we know that postpartum uh, trauma and postpartum depression is a real thing and it needs to be given the amount of services that she needs to help get through that. Um, it is a very small wing. They have natural light in there. They have their own hygiene in there. They have TV. They have an emergency phone. It's everything that she needs to feel whole again and to take time out for herself away from the reality of her sentencing uh, to help her get through that. I am extremely proud of that, that unit that we have. That's awesome. Awesome. Very awesome. nice, very, that's just one. Now, even if you haven't had a baby, <laughs> there are programs and, and uh, policies that we put in place because we understand that regardless of a woman's station in life and her circumstance, no one has the right to tell her what her hygiene means should look like. No one has a right to do that. So out of dignity, it is. And out of that, we have birthed what's called hygiene cabinets. And these are simply cabinets that we have put in every dorm, in every facility, with every hygiene item that is needed for, for her to take care of herself, not for her to ask. It is about dignity. It is about preserving that dignity. So those cabinets are, get filled up regularly, regularly, and um, we don't put limits on it. That's a huge change from 20 years ago. It yeah. is. For, uh, the end of their, yeah. Even just from yeah. the first time I was with the more program, it's <laughs> having to ask for yes. something, you know. Yes. Yes. And that's embarrassing. It yes. is. It is. And a lot of times having to ask a man exactly. for, for those items, and what if he, what if he, we're having a bad day that day, you know, so now. And if he's going to question why he, he doesn't understand right. why you might need extra. Yeah. Or right, right. right. So, and why, why should you have to, why should you have to put yourself through that? Yeah. That's very That's traumatic. Sad. So out of that, we have hygiene items in there. They get them as often as they need them. That is, that's mm -hmm. right. Fantastic. Yeah. So Renee. Yes. You guys are doing some awesome work over in the reentry unit you know, with DCS. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you guys have going on and what um, connections you all have made through collaborations within the community to help with uh, women's services? Okay, I'm going to highlight some um, some of the organizations that we are working with. I do want to add a little bit when we're talking about the person-centered supervision, um, how we take that a step further in reentry services with our community coordinators who are doing a, some form of case management, which we call strip based case management, where we teach people who come in to have agency and learn how to solve problems for themselves. And so oh, that's a big one. Yeah, problem yes. solve. Problem solving. solving. You've so, told somebody <laughs> a lifetime of stuff exactly. there. Exactly. Exactly. Got ESP skills there. ESP yeah. and a motivational interview and all of that. But Pulling all that together so that we're not just holding your hand, right? Sometimes people do need extra help. They do. Sometimes they need extra guidance. But we always remind them, you have done this in the past. You did that successfully in the past. You are, you are on the road to recovery. You are moving in a good direction. And we honor that, right? And we help them to build up their self-confidence, motivation, and right. in the middle of the process. And we don't do it alone. We have a lot of 
phenomenal organizations who partner with us. So I am going to just give us a quick list of um, some of the organizations who are working specifically with women. They will include um, domestic violence shelters, pregnancy resource centers. We work with family, family literacy programs, um, healthcare clinics. We do a lot around healthcare. Um, we sign people up for healthcare insurance as well. Um, we do work with career readiness programs. Um, one of the organizations in Atlanta is Every Woman Works. They work with women to develop um, self-sufficiency um, so that they can one, one day live alone with their kids and support their families. And they have a holistic approach to the work that they're doing. So they're looking at trauma, right? They're looking at self-esteem as well and making sure that every part of a woman's life is going to be addressed and that they can grow. We work with In Her Shoes in Douglasville. They do emergency housing, um, transitional housing for up to two years. Also holistic, they're doing educational assistance, tutoring, college prep. We have a lot of organizations that are coming along and working with us to move people along to um, from GED to high school diploma, um, still, and then also they're able to get college um, college degrees. And that get, goes toward the, the stigma and the stereotype, right? right. Um, and, and the economic stability. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, we've got For Sarah in Conyers, Georgia, emotional, physical, spiritual support. Um, they're working with women who have been a part of the entertainment industry, sex workers and escorts. So they're doing beautiful work as well. Angels in Flight in Wrightsville, 12-step recovery program for women. Baby Steps Recovery in Doug Douglasville, working with pregnant women um, who have substance use issues. Mothers Could Beyond Bars, we've worked with them for quite a while. They do excellent work um, with women who are pregnant or who have recently given birth. And they don't only work in the Atlanta or the metro area, they will work anywhere in the state. And they have a doula, and this is a really family setup. It's amazing. It's amazing. Hey, you were saying that about the education and talking about, yes. I'll say one neat thing, even prior to being released that we have at um, the Transitional Center is we have partnered with the community college there, and we have girls that actually get involved in the welding program and they actually get to go to the campus there and take welded classes yes. and get their certification. And then uh, Kubota, that's actually a global manufacturing company of agriculture equipment, mm -hmm. has agreed and they hire uh, the women there. And I learned something that women are usually better welders than men because they have little hands and oh, real oh, detail for yeah. and detail yeah. for and yes, and mm -hmm. they love to hire the women from the transitional center, and they make really great money, which allows them to save up and gives them a head start once yep. they are, re are released. And um, yeah, women that are able to go ahead and pay deposits on. A place to live prior to their release so they can walk right out the door. We help them go get furniture. I even helped a lady go buy a car two days before she was released the other day. Yes. And, yes. And, uh, you know, so, you know, and then the day she was released, I took her to go pick it up so that way she'd already gotten her insurance and everything. So that gives them a, a big head start. And yes. I think it is a great motivation and self esteem thing. Yeah. Them. Just yeah. to see the look on their face. You know, and for them to be able to be given that opportunity with education. And hey, Renee, uh, you, you talked about health care. You know, yes. uh, you guys uh, are helping these these ladies and men, but, right. but particularly with ladies with health care and dental care, if they can get insurance to get their medical needs met and their especially right. dental work, that helps increase self esteem, mm -hmm. self worth, mm -hmm. and that will help. Um, you know, it, it really helps people get better jobs in the community. Yes, um, yes. So, so that that healthcare uh, connection is really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're in. And Pam, what's next on the horizon for corrections? Oh wow! Uh, for <laughs> weather services, uh, I think I can uh, speak on that. Uh, we are continuing to evolve uh, the care around our pregnant offenders. Uh, Renee mentioned doula. We have started a doula program. Uh, at our facility that is totally dedicated to pregnant offenders. There is only one facility that a pregnant offender will go to until she has her baby. 
And that same uh, facility has doulas and, and they come in. Uh, it's with a partnership with Emory School of Nursing and, and the doulas are actually nursing, final year nursing students who have passed the background check to be a certified volunteer for the agency. And they come in and they provide that additional care uh, simply because you need that support from a non-medical standpoint. You need that support. Some of these ladies, this is the first time they, they're having a baby and maybe she doesn't understand a Braxton Hicks and what right. that is. Yeah. But you have a doula that is connected to you and we allow the doulas to follow them throughout the process of delivery. They're the ones that are in the actual actual delivery room with them. Yeah. It is a great support system. The program is Phenomenal. But we can't do what we do in corrections without our leaders. So I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the superstars, the real superstars, um, the men and women that work in women's services, the correctional officers, the wardens and the superintendents. They are phenomenal people. Uh, and they really, they really have pushed our agency out front when it comes to women's services and the care that we provide for the unique needs that they have. Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And, and, and going back to, to person-centered supervision, I just want to talk a few more, because you mentioned um, the trauma-informed care. Yes. And DCS has also mandated uh, trauma-informed care for all officers. Really? And in the Department of Community Supervision. That's awesome. So that is awesome. So, you know, I think, yes. you know, I would be remiss to, to 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 mention or not mention our dedicated officers that work, you know, in the trenches day in and day out and the support um, from, you know, their managers and supervisors. Because I think, you know, it, it's evident that we all are all in this together. Oh, yeah. Um, we For have sure. three different agencies sitting here, Correct. but we are all intertwined and we're all working towards the same mission. Yes. And I just want to thank you all for participating today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Goodness. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.